the steam locomotive. Masterpiece of raw power. Supreme creation of the mechanical age. The gliding grace of its motion. The massiveness of its great limbs, joints and knuckles. The relentless rhythm of connecting rods, back and forth, up and down, round and round. There is a lilt to this reciprocating motion and a charm in its incongruous grace. The steam locomotive was one of the great mechanical marvels of the 19th century. A beast of steel with a soul of fire. And from the union of fire and water comes the power to blast 2,000 tons of train into action. Steam locomotives revel in their own power, the faithful servants of man, the workhorses of history. Tons of thrashing steel powered by steam alone. No other invention since the wheel itself so changed the way the world moved. And in the steamy wake of the iron horse, the continents of the world were conquered. South Africa, an arid, sprawling, thinly settled country. This is an ancient, geologically stable land with vast reserves of coal. And because of these, steam traction survived here beyond its tenure in the modern world. In this, the twilight of steam, South Africa stands as one of the last lonely outposts. Like the last bull elephant on the plains, these machines are the symbol of a changing Africa and of the disappearance of a mystique that no one can quite put their finger on. The stuff of childhood memories, the quintessence of railway romance. The steam locomotive is one of the few machines where a physical and emotional rapport with man really counts. But they are fast disappearing, and with them, the special breed of person who cares for them. This is the end of a way of life, and the end of a distinct and incomparably romantic period of railway history. We're aboard locomotive number 3439, hurtling through the winter night towards the remote desert town of Diar, 200 kilometers away. We're riding part of the main line between Johannesburg and Cape Town, a highway of steel that connects the far-flung towns and lonely villages of the Great Karoo. Roaring along at 90 kilometers an hour, the ear-splitting blast of the exhaust is the exuberant music of power, the sound of 3,000 horsepower pulling 1,200 tons of train.
Trailing her fluffy plume across the lawn, 3439 at last approaches an oasis in the desert. This is the Orange River, and at the little station just beyond it, she will stop to revive her fire and quench her thirst. Stations on this stretch of the line are few and far between, tiny nodes on the main stem of a great commercial route. Between Kimberley to the north and the Ar to the south lie 300 kilometres of harsh semi-desert. And it is at Orange River Station that 3439 must catch her breath and replenish her reserves for the long haul that lies ahead. Since leaving Kimberley, 35,000 litres of water have been turned to steam in 3439's massive boiler. Her huge firebox has devoured over five tonnes of coal since the journey began, much of it not properly digested. These clogging masses of clinker block the all-important draught that fans the fire. They are the product of impurities in South Africa's low-grade coal. Ministering to these engines is a workaday ritual, an inescapable discipline, the daily grind of the steam age. We may find these postscripts to the Industrial Revolution picturesque, but for the engine and her crew, some hard work lies ahead. 40 kilometers of uphill slogging. touch with every heartbeat of the iron beast, the driver coaxes her onward. Her bright exhaust hangs over the hard-won miles of scrub as Orange River Station recedes into the massive aloofness of the African felt. The desolation is broken only by oncoming trains and the odd sleepy hamlet. Dotted sparsely along the line, tiny isolated station communities huddle close to the tracks. They exist purely to serve the railway.
With its vast overland distances, the African subcontinent has always depended upon the kind of long-haul transport that only the railway can provide. Not so long ago, no less than 80 steam trains a day plied this route. On this very ordinary morning in July 1985, as 34, 39 and her crew work an everyday freight to De Aar, they are unaware that they are already making future history. Within eight years, steam will be gone. But for now, the driver has 1,200 tons in the palm of his hand. He and his fireman ride the iron horse up yet another long, exacting climb. The steam enthusiast is a rather unusual breed of person. He is usually male, has a wide territorial range, is cunning and relentless in his search for prey, and may be encountered foraging singly or hunting in small groups with other adult males. As his prey becomes scarcer, he is forced to range further and further afield in search of it. He likes it best in its natural habitat, on the hoof, blasting through the African felt. He is obsessed with the moment of capture, and the more elusive his prey, the more acute his desire. He will employ sophisticated technology and spare no expense in pursuit of it. He will climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every timetable till he finds his dream. And his dream is the perfect shot. Good steam photography requires solid determination and a strong sense of purpose. Ah, oh, fine day today. When the location is right, the light is right, the timing is right, then there is a sense of complete satisfaction. Dusty Durrant is one of a handful of really serious steam enthusiasts. One could call him a professional enthusiast. He's written countless books and photographed steam in every corner of the world. He's a tireless crusader for the cause. Cheers. His house, in his own words, is a temple of steam. Here's the steam. Like many people who feel powerfully, yet unaccountably moved by something, he can't explain why. It's something which I've had from a small boy for no reason at all. I became fascinated with steam locomotives, and I really don't know why. None of my family were interested in steam or engineering or anything like that, and it just came out of the blue. Boyhood in Britain during the steam age. Scuffed shoes and homework left undone. Afternoons spent at the trackside charting train movements and identifying engines. But for a youngster with a passion for adventure, the call of the wild was an urgent one. Like many English romantics of his generation, a hankering for wilderness took him to Africa, the land of vast plains 
and untamed steam locomotives. What makes one so interested in steam? To many people, steam is a romantic thing. To some, it's a case of nostalgia. The older people who remember the steam trains of their boyhood, to them it's nostalgic. But for youngsters today, there must be something more to it. Part of this is the spectacle of it. The steam train is something very much alive. It's elemental, it's fire, steel, water. How then, on two-dimensional film, does one capture the romance and the spectacle of living steam? To get a really good steam photograph, there are innumerable factors which have to be taken into consideration, of which the most important thing is light. The light must be at the right angle, which means it must be quite low down, so you light up all the details. The train itself has to be working hard uphill with lots of black smoke or white steam and the background should preferably be some sort of scenery or completely plain. The smoke in a photograph is a controversial thing in some ways. A good steam locomotive well handled shouldn't make smoke. So when you come down to it, um, all trains should be smokeless, but of course smoke makes a very nice picture. You can see the thing is going, but you don't need to overdo it. A very nice thing is a cloudy background with the sun on the train. These help to make a really perfect photograph. I think the absolute master photograph probably has a bigger degree of luck in it than the ordinary good ones. The ordinary good ones can be planned and be got, but the master photograph is very much a matter of luck, I think. In photography, one likes to have a unique photograph. There's nothing more satisfying than being at some wonderful place and getting a stupendous photograph and you're the only person there. But today, with far fewer steam trains, one often gets whole lines up of people all taking the same photograph. Whatever you do, you are trying for something better than you've done before. Even if it's a photograph you've taken a dozen times before, it has never been perfect, and you always hope that the next one will be the perfect shot. If it isn't, then you go again and try again. And of course, you can always race after the train and catch it at another good spot further along the line. In fact, good photo spots are hallowed places to steam photographers Discovered through years of calculated trial and error, they hold the promise of the perfect shot. Waiting at the chosen spot, there is always the nagging possibility that the train has beaten you to it. The reassuring sight of smoke on the horizon relieves the tension and lifts the sagging spirits. Then, adrenaline floods the bloodstream and the chase is on. There's a wonderful location further down the line. If only you can get there before the train does. All along the rail side, dedicated enthusiasts face the hazards of the chase not the least of which is the dreaded South African barbed wire fence.
Steam is disappearing, and in the wake of any passing reality come imitations of the original. We love to dress up and reenact history. Everyday working steam has gone. In an attempt to recapture it, we lay on nostalgic steam specials. The locomotives chosen for these specials are the creme de la creme. For this summer evening's outing, number 3454 has creamed herself to perfection. She is fast, powerful, and very glamorous. Desert wastes once rang day and night with the honest music of these brawny machines. Now, the last steam locomotive has worked its last payload across the Great Karoo, and the silence is complete. The word Karoo, in Hottentot, means place of dryness. The buffeting winds are hot and gritty. The vegetation is stiff underfoot. In summer, disembodied mountains float dreamily above a burning earth. Distant trains emerge from the haze like ghosts. In the trembling heat, sound wavers unsteadily and outlines are indeterminate. Locomotives working in this unforgiving land need both strength and stamina. Loads are heavy. Gradients are slow, but stubborn. Distances are long. More than anything, this land is parched. Rain, when it does fall, always seems to fall somewhere else. Yet water is life to steam engines, and in the early 50s, under the pressure of this need, a specialized locomotive evolved. Through the silence comes a haunting whine, the signature tune of a strange machine. This is the true ship of the desert, a locomotive that can travel 1,100 kilometers without taking fresh water. She achieves this impressive range by condensing her own steam back into water. Her specialized tender functions just like a giant radiator, cooling the exhaust steam from the cylinders and condensing it back into water.
On the roof of the tender, five massive fans suck great volumes of cool air through this radiator. There, the steam is cooled by the airflow and the condensed water is run off into tanks to be reused as required. But the water-saving sophistication of these engines came at the price of frequent and costly maintenance. The complexities of the condensing apparatus undermined one of the great strengths of the steam locomotive, its inherent simplicity. Over the next three decades, the condensing locomotives were converted to ordinary free steamers. Their tenders were converted to mere water tanks and, stripped of their dignity, they were given the nickname Sausage Dogs. The spirited vitality of these machines belies the fact that they are on their way to extinction. A last attempt to save them as an economically viable form of motive power for South Africa was made in the early 80s, when a host of special refinements was added to the basic design. The prototype, affectionately known as the Red Devil, was bred for power, speed and fuel efficiency. In short, for performance. In fact, so eager to perform was she that she tripped over her own feet in doing so. With so much extra power, she rather lost her grip on the rails. She wasn't at her best slipping and sliding out of a station, but once let loose on the open road, she was a stunning performer. But despite her power, and despite her speed, she remained an anachronism. In the annals of steam history, she is now nothing more than a tantalizing symbol of what might have been. And the railway management of the day had indeed already invested heavily in diesels. In 1991, they proclaimed, was to see the last of steam on this, the Kimberley de R line. There was instant angry clamour from steam lovers worldwide, in response to which a placatory steam festival was staged. The steam locomotives put on their Sunday best, snatched the available traffic from the diesels, and gave a week-long curtain call. Skeptics say that steam specials are monuments to extinction, that preserved engine species, no longer viable in their natural habitats, are exported to exotic locations like so many animals to a zoo. There was certainly a parade of body types, from short-legged, stubby little freight engines to long-legged lopers designed to haul crack passenger trains at high speeds. To the cynic, such an improbable and motley collection may seem ridiculous. But for a steam lover basking in the soft evening glow of nostalgia, it can as easily be sublime.
essence, the life, the exuberance of real, working steam is an elusive entity that resists being dished up on a plate. Yet today, enthusiasts are being strictly rationed on a diet of pre-packaged steam. Now, this is all that is left. Engines and their crews posing for photographs in the glare of specially rigged lights and enjoying a round of applause. For those wanting to lay their appreciative hands on the beast itself, a good steam festival provides even that opportunity. For a fee, you can drive your own steam locomotive. Oh, I'm Patrick. Oh, I'm Irv Hirsch from the USA. Glad to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All righty. Thank you. Can I explain to you? Yeah. This is your reverser. All right. That's to go forward. That's to go back. Now, okay, you know, push your drifter forward, right? Right in the middle of this control here. Right forward, right forward. All the way forward. Regulate your speed, regulate. Okay, okay. Hey, what? If you pick up speed now, it's a bit of a level, yeah? Okay. Then you place it under the down, and then we got a bit of a half field. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's plenty hot. I think we'll make it. I've been to South Africa three times. This is this is the best. Getting to drive your own locomotive. You yes. can't get better than that. <laughs> Certainly there is an air of the American Wild West about it all. But puttering along on a little branch line can surely come nowhere close to the real thing. Thrashing along the main line with a real driver at the helm and 1,200 tons of real train in tow. Tran Villiers is a retired driver now, but he relives the good old days as though they were yesterday. There are people who love steam engines so much that they have dedicated their entire lives to working on them. They now feel very keenly about the demise of something they lived and breathed for. When steam ended in Britain, a number of like-minded people left there to work on steam in South Africa. This abiding love of steam is something which often begins at an early age. Jeff Hall has had steam in his blood since early childhood. From when I was a very small boy in the UK, I used to go train spotting along with many hundreds and thousands of other people. So it's just developed from there. Uh, I just got fascinated by a steam locomotive. To see one thundering through a station or on a main line, it just gave me a, a thrill I, I, I couldn't really get from any, anything else. I don't know what it was and then it sort of just got into my blood and, and from that that time onwards I've I've just been hooked, hooked on steam. Jeff arrived in South Africa in 1973 
and has enjoyed every working minute. This is more than just a job, it's a way of life. It's tough and it's dirty, and Jeff wouldn't change it for the world. I just feel the great power there in, in that locomotive that it's, it works on basic elements like coal and water converted to steam. I mean, there's nothing fancy about it at all. And there's such a lot of power in a machine. I mean, it's just a credit to the design and manufacture of, of uh, those people many years ago that the steam locomotives are still running today. Um, I'm always in awe of, of, of steam locomotives. But this line in particular, Kimberley Da, it's got magic properties, especially running through the crew there. You're alone there on, on that great iron beast. There's nothing quite like it. I can't imagine myself doing any other sort of job. And steam finally goes if it ever does. I, I don't know what's going to happen. For a steam lover, Driving a locomotive is akin to playing a temperamental musical instrument. On a steam locomotive, it doesn't quite help just pouring tons and tons of coal into the firebox. If it's making tons of black smoke, that just won't help. You've got to know exactly how much to put in and how little, and where to put it, and be able to read your fire and things like that, and to keep the steam at the red mark if you can. Well, people think of the mechanical stoke of just rolling the coal into the fire and the train goes, but not quite like that, you've got all different jets and you've got to control it so it gives an even fire on your grate. White and bright, as they say. Richard Niven has been happily getting his hands dirty as a fireman since he was 23. Along with fellow Britisher John Gilberthorpe, who is his regular driver, Richard drinks in the atmosphere of the steam age. He lives for the smoke and the throb of the engine's exhaust, knowing that he helped to put it there. And riding the tracks through a pristine African dawn is high up on his list of fringe benefits. After hours of bucking and swaying, there is yet more work to do, preparing the engine for the return trip. Steam engines are like babies. Their appetite for attention is constant and voracious, and they respond to it noisily. In their personalities, power and helplessness exist side by side. I've always loved steam engines right from being a small kid. And uh, I always wanted to work on them, but I didn't have the opportunity in Britain. And so I thought, well, I'll come to South Africa and have a go on them. It's the last place in the world where I could really get a job on them. These men are perhaps the most satisfied enthusiasts of all. They've had much more than just the vicarious pleasure of photographs. They have actually inhabited the world that so vividly fires the imagination of others. The power and the, the appearance, the sound, the whole aura about them, I think. Everything that goes with them, it just sort of breeds atmosphere. It never fails to appeal to me. I'm always leaning out of the engine, listening to her, how she's performing. You can see the clouds of smoke and steam rolling behind. It looks terrific. It sounds terrific as well. locomotive is not a passive machine. It sighs, breathes, and responds like a living being. It is almost human. It eats, it drinks. The quality of the fuel that you put into it, you get the same sort of power out of it, the same as with a person. And if you look after it, it'll look after you. And you will treat it and she'll do the same to you too. <laughs> To John and his colleagues, the steam locomotive is queen of her domain. 
the very notion of her abdication in favour of a lowly diesel is enough to leave anyone utterly speechless. And surely neither can anyone who has ever witnessed a steam train in anger. The Karoo, a sea of grand desolation. Slicing through it, lost in the vastness, runs the Kimberley de R line, once a great theatre of steam. Signs of humanity here are few. Railway, the odd farmhouse, the occasional road. Now and then, such a road may lead to one of the line-side villages that minister to the railway. This road leads to the village of Bitput and to its delightful hotel. In the heyday of steam, these little railway guest houses were havens for enthusiasts. Like moths to a flame, they came from all over the world. In this desert oasis, there is peace, quiet just a stone's throw away, a great and historic steam railway. The railway is the lifeblood of a colourful rural community. As a long, hot Saturday draws to a close, the tiny community of Vitput comes to life in a celebration of just being. On their doorstep, the local freight shunts its last load for the weekend. On the line side, enthusiasts wind up the day's filming and head back to a hotel dinner and clean white sheets. The hotel generator throbs into life. The sun sets over the scrub and a dusty little African village is transfigured. And out of the dusk comes a familiar sound, waxing and waning on the breeze.
a sound of a magnificent machine, loved by thousands, for whom twilight has already become night.